Welcome to the third uh, Isa Kanna lecture, and which is the last of the series, and it tries to look from a meta uh, methodological perspective. Um, it tries to see well, actually to get a little bit of disorder or counter order into the discussions on digitization as we find them today. Now the discussion as we find them today is mostly about the mainstream issues, work, labor, social security, future of jobs. And of course it is most important, it is of immediate importance as I mentioned earlier, but trying to get a hold of the entire and wider concept uh, the aim is here to look at digitization as a matter of a juncture, uh, a juncture of artificial intelligence on the one hand and a shift of power relations and the awareness thereof. It is, for instance, the move from Anthropocene, Capitalocene, Ecocapitalism, as Anna Altfater talks about it, and it is a more or less common discussion today. Uh, looking at the discussion on, on Moore and, and others. Uh, but I want to add another dimension, which is the techno scene. Now, all this is not entirely new. It is not a human being, but it is a mode of production. It is capitalism that uh, shapes the entire uh, structure of how we use, how we position. Uh, human beings as such in relation to each other, but as well in terms of um, the environment, what we call environment. As I said, it is an objective process, <clears throat> but it is as well being aware of it, the increasing awareness, the way of dealing with it. Techno scene, we use technologies for a long, long time that I want to edit here has the special reason and uh, on a general level it is the orientation based on feasibility and the possibility to do everything. This, this awareness, this consciousness we can do from our own perspective and in our own uh, will. Now this is actually a reductionist approach, although it seems at first glance we widen the scope of our activities, it is reduced by the technicalization of everything. Everything is put into pieces, small pieces, and it is only possible in terms of technicalities. Which means that we have to face today, talking about digitization, not least about the tension and the complementarity of digitization and informatization. These are two different things. And with this, the change of the composition of value, the organic composition of capital, the value of what is the social value, actually, of the things we do. Now all these Anthropocene, Capitalocene, Ecologocene and Technocene are not overcoming each other, not replacing each other, but we are dealing with this, what uh, we know from Hegel, from dialectics, the process of Aufhebung as a matter of supplation and supersession. The second point then, and here it is really about a, a meta-methodology. I want to refer to the work of Paul Bukhara, especially the later work where he talks about the issues of um, a change of civilization. Non-troponymie systematic. It is a new 
anthroponomic system that deals with human beings in their environment and the self-understanding, our self-understanding. And of course, this is and will always will be a matter of power. A matter of power, controlling oneself, controlling others, controlling the relationship to others, and again, the effect, the matter of nature coming into play. In any case, all these matters of anthroponomic systems are a matter of bordering, the definition of the we and the other, as we permanently find it as a matter that goes through history. And it is as such as well about identity. Identity as a matter of control over the mode of production. Identity as process, processing identity and building up changing identities. Not without power struggles, not without conflicts, but as such, not just the simple mechanical uh, confrontation of two sides or more sides. Of course, there are life issues, lifestyle issues, and the changes of mindsets relevant in all this. As soon as we talk about identity, we think about these lifestyles and change your mindset and behave in a rational way, whatever this means. Important. But I think we have to think, we have to keep be aware of following buts. It's not a matter of choice. It is not a matter of mechanical submission and dependency of a quadriga of accumulation regimes, living regimes, modes of regulation and modes of life. I take this from the theory of regulation. Taking them together, these four issues, we are dealing with a systematic mode of societal production and reproduction. This comes up again and again, and especially with the work of Brandt and Wissen, it is currently as the mode of the imperial mode of uh, life, something on dog. But we have a much deeper analysis already many years ago. For instance, um, Fernand Baudel's Grammaire de Civilisation and uh, Pierre Bourdieu's Field of Cultural Production. This is going deep into this way of how we are involved actively in conflict, looking for our own powers, not independently as a matter of will, of willpower, but in this uh, permanent confrontation with the mode of production. On a little side note, it is actually interesting uh, to look at some detailed development in this context, not least as this is uh, again and again coming up and, and being issued. Now, don't get carried away, at least I don't get carried away. But there is this movement, the so, so called slow food movement. I don't know really much about it, but it seems to be interesting that this is not just about a mindset or a choice, a lifestyle, but looking at least at the origin of this, it is about the production, the co-production and the claim of workers' rights to be involved to have the right not only to consume in order to reproduce oneself, but as a matter of producing the social. From the manifest, questo nostro secolo, nato e cresciuto sotto il segno della civiltà industriale, ha prima inventato la macchina e poi ne ha fatto il proprio modello di vita. La velocità è diventata la nostra catena. Tutti siamo in preda allo stesso virus. La fast life, 
che sconvolge il nostro, eh, la nostra abitudine di ci passare fin, eh, fin nel nostro caso, ci rinciare i nutrici di fast food. It is the century born and grown under the sign of industrial civilization, the first invent of the machine and then made it its model of life. This is the mode of life. Speed has become our chain. We are all in the same virus, the fast life, which upsets our habits, attacks us right into our homes, locks us up and uh, locks us up to feed in the fast food. Now this is something that we cannot escape voluntarily. This is something where we have to develop a new understanding of production and reproduction of our life. And this is always taking place, even if we say or we, if we refer to Karl Polanyi's work of this disembedding, having the market on the one hand disjoined from society. There is always some form of embeddedness and it is the market economy that actually specifies terms and conditions of embeddedness. It is a matter of the entire mode of production. It is a matter of the accumulation regime. We all, well, not we all, but we know about the need today of find an embeddedness of artificial intelligence by these uh, futuristic scenarios, uh, sometimes looking strange and, and surprising and even exciting, of course. Going a little bit back, namely in 30, uh, in 83, 1983, we know from Vasily Lentiev in his little piece on the definition of problems of, uh, and opportunities, we know about the fate of horses. Horses not being organized, not being trade unionized, and not being able to maintain themselves in their role in society. Horses are gone, don't play a role today anymore, at least only a very marginal. Then, much later, Nicholson talked about the lost art of walking, as you see the, the, the link between the culture, the way of life. The lost art of walking, complementing Daniel Bay's spirit of cities, and all this reflecting what Norton talks about reflects on the dawn of the motor age in the American city. Now we seem, seemingly have technical, technological processes. We have changes of uh, the way of organizing things. True enough. Just a quote from Norton. Prevailing social constructions of the street, for example, were stable in 1900. The automobile destabilized them. Social groups such as pedestrians with pedestrians, parents, police and downtown business associations organized to preserve streets as they knew them. But their actions threatened to limit the automobile's urban horizons. In the 1920s, automotive interests, or motodome, as they were sometimes called, proposed that custom social constructions of the street were outdated and that only a revolutionary change in perceptions of the street could ease congestions and prevent accidents. At the beginning of Norton's book, he quotes George Harold, insisting in 1927, streets are public property, not to be abused, but to be used with convenience for the good of the greatest number. This is the real 
issue here. Streets are public property. It's not the technicality, but it is the understanding of public property, of publicness. Of course, at that time, early of the previous century, it was a nightmare of experience when the first accident, fatal accident, happened. And this is what we, find, uh, what we uh, witnessed only a few weeks ago, the first fatal accident caused by a driver's vehicle. I don't want to be cynical or sound cynical. More people will be killed. And the problem is not the technical side of it. It is not even the legal side of it. It is the legal side of it in terms of public property, the race publica, and the mechanical responses. I will come back to this later. First, another point. All our thinking, as I said, I'm talking about meta-methodology, our thinking is caught in, I would suggest, three major ways of approaching or paradigms of approaching realities. It is about methodological individualism. Classes is seen as identity, not as a process. And from here we go back to Fordism, the welfare state the support of individuals by some, strangely enough, new form of individual, the state, the organized individual state. It had been a long time ago that we find the state as patriarchal um, institution looking after the so-called citizens. This is very much a continuation we find there. And it is linked to the second paradigm, the second approach, which is methodological nationalism. Even if we talk permanently about globalization, if we consider the role and importance of international or supranational organizations, we are caught in this idea of a methodological nationalism. So far so good. It's very much a common approach, a common understanding and widely known, widely accepted. Now the third moment coming into play I want to call, for the time being at least, methodological solutionism as a strategy, as I said earlier, a strategy of technic technicalities going hand in hand with permanent strategies of externalization, relative downgrading of living standards, or dependence on discounters of cheap goods, cheap uh, groceries, and an increasing share of our income needed for the necessities of life, not least accommodation at least for the majority of the people, this is a fact that is difficult to overcome, to oversee. We are just struggling away. On the one hand, we have this idea we can do everything, we have the technical means, at the same time, in our social existence, we don't. And this kind of downgrading, passing on the bucket, is a global process. As we seemingly have this uh, in our society, this idea of being consuming permanently and, and being individualist, it is individual struggle. It is not about distribution. That seems to be the case here in our so-called developed societies, but it is as well about separation of production and distribution and the production being at least seemingly externalized. 
at least if we go through our cities, um, there is no production. That's not what we see. Perhaps the production of a new metro line or something like this. It is all about shopping, the experience of shopping, and even more so now the experience of Apple stores that are spaces for experience. All this is part of chain. People like to talk, economists like to talk about value chains. The real value change is the poverty chain. And part of this chain is the planet of slums being the extreme of the production of Fox, uh, Foxconn. Producing for Apple, producing for something, producing not least sub in, in, in a way subsidized products of these multinationals. Because I think this is a very important point, not least having repercussions on our life in the so-called developed, uh, developed uh, countries. Developed countries, I want to have a, a, provide a lengthy quote so about this. It's from Benjamin Sullivan, the global value chains or global poverty chains. He talks about a new research agenda, and I think it is a new research agenda, at least in this comprehensive way. And I think it is really very important to keep this in mind and to follow it extremely. First, he says, the production of cheap goods across the global south and the export to the global north have lowered the cost of northern wage and capital goods. Lowering the former reduces the cost of reproducing labor power and can contribute to pushing wages down. Lowering the latter reduces the cost of capital investment. Second, Offshoring contributes to the restructuring of labor markets in ways very unfavorable to labor. Third, then, a long-term process of labor repression in the North through states and firm strategies of demobilizing labor has cut radically workers' wages, according to the Washington-based Pew Research Center. After adjusting for inflation, today's average hourly wage has just about the same purchasing as it did in 1979, following a long slide in the 1980s and the early 1990s, and bumpy, inconsistent growth since then. In real terms, the average wage peaked more than 40 years ago. Not 14 years ago. The 4.03 an hour rate dollar, recorded in January 73, has the same purchasing power as the 20. 2.41 dollar would have today. Fourth, then, the threat of offshoring represents a Democles word that firms and states across the global north hang above the heads of their laboring classes as they seek to raise the rate of labor exploitation, which they call raising productivity. Jack Welch, a former CEO of General Electric, told his shareholders that we must remove that lower 10% and keep removing it every year, always raise, rising the bar of performance. This strategy has become known as performance management, forced ranking and rank and yank, objective of removing least productive workers. According to one estimate, up to 60% of US firms employ such techniques. Such management techniques are designed to rise labor productivity and increase competition between workers. The latter, the better, the reduced possibilities of labor solidarity. In the context of stagnant wages, these, product, these productivity increases are retained primarily by firms shareholders. So, lengthy quote ends here. And I think this shows clearly that we cannot speak of our so-called developed countries and the developing countries there, the new market economy, 
communities, the transition communities or something. All this depends on each other, is closely linked, systematically linked, and feeds into this process of uh, the way we live, our culture. And with this, this, techno this, this uh, methodological solutionism has another side, a kind of propaganda side, if you want. It is a methodological denialism. Our societies, we and them. We strictly differentiate between them. Instead of seeing, of accepting this global community, instead of accepting systematically, and I'm not talking about intellectual uh, um, acceptance of these facts, but uh, systematically and methodologically uh, accepting these connections. Interestingly, in 2002, a uh, book published by the United Nations uh, in the framework of the UN Development, uh, Development Program was talking about this in terms of an immediate link. Development program means or has to mean the provision of global public goods. You see, I'm coming back to this issue of publicness. This is the core of our understanding of our rights-based approach when it comes uh, to the move forward in terms of new technical means as well. This means as well social protection, labor, all these are important issues. But another perspective allows us to criticize the human rights perspective, the traditional human rights perspective, not going far enough. It is not about just fighting slavery. It's amazing how much slavery we still find in this world. But it is as well criticizing this universal declaration that refers to the right of being employed. Wage slavery under the conditions we find today is by no means necessary. I talked, coming to the next point, about solutionism. Nachtwey and Seidel suggest this as the successor of the Protestant ethics. Morozov sees it more as a folly depending fundamentally on uh, the fooling of people, uh, misguiding of attitudes. As a successor of Protestant ethics, I think we have to take it seriously and look for the core of what we actually face there. It is a reductionist principle of causal, uh, causalities. A complex understanding is not foreseen under this heading of solutionism. It is about cutting off contradictions, contradictions as driving force of social societal development. This is not accepted, it's all put into little boxes, and if it fits, it's fine. If not, we cut more off, but we are not allowing contradictions, tensions as driving force. This cutting off is a process of alienation by externalization. As I said, we in our so-called developed developed countries, societies, we don't produce. Production is taking place in another part of the world. And this includes splitting complex systems into manageable, detailed tasks. Ibola Gibere 
speaks of the project-oriented society. This is what we find in all these jobs. We have little projects. This is what we have to fulfill. The wider context is about translating this project-oriented existence into responsibility as a matter of responding immediate responding, immediate responses to tasks, to challenges that we have to solve today. And on the other hand, we have the res publica. Separated from this, the res publica as a matter of publicness and the readiness of entering contests, disputes, accepting these tensions and accepting these contradictions. As I said before, it is about externalization and bordering, defining something, always facing the questions of how much or to which extent do we actually accept difference. It's interesting, in 1872, Rudolf von Gehring wrote a little piece or presented something uh, under the title of The Struggle for Law. The life, he said, the life of law is a struggle, a struggle of peoples, of state power, of classes and of values. Indeed, law has meaning only as an exp expression of conflict and it represents the effort of humanity to tame itself. But unfortunately, the law has tried to counter violence and injustice with means that will one day be as alienating as they are shameful in a rational world. For law has never really tried to resolve the conflicts of society, but only to alleviate them by laying down rules according to which they should be fought out. Das Leben des Rechts ist ein Kampf, ein Kampf der Völker, der Staatsmacht, der Klassen und Individuen. In der Tat hat das Recht eine Bedeutung nur als Ausdruck von Konflikten und es stellt die Anstrengung der Menschheit dar, sich selbst zu zählen. Aber leider hat das Recht versucht, der Gewalt und dem Unrecht mit Mitteln zu begegnen, die einer vernünftigen Welt, der einst als ebenso befremdlich und schändlich gelten will. Denn das Recht hat niemals wirklich versucht, die Konflikte der Gesellschaft zu lösen, sondern nur sie zu lindern, indem es Regeln niederlegte, nach welchen sie ausgefochten werden soll. Ist this Kumbranusalis the general problem of rules? that are there without substance and without any understanding, without this readiness to engage in conflicts and dispute. I want to come from here to another issue, namely the more economic side. Value. What we face today, and not only today, and Kenneth Galbraith was talking as well about the uh, private wealth, the affluent society, even if the society as such publicly was getting poorer. Well, it's again something that follows us and has extremes now. Actually, we find a similar uh, discussion in the end of the 19th century in the United States on corporations. Anyway. Value. We face today the situation of overaccumulation, devaluation, and the problem of productivity. Apparently, the productivity is slowing down. I mentioned organic um, composition of capital. The question, however, is not the problem of productivity. The real problem is what should we produce and why should we produce this? And this is, of course, a matter of what is public, what is 
accepted as social and defined as social value. Understanding what is required are the old questions, the tension of value and valuation. The production as social activity versus enclosed labor, enclosed labor in terms of producing within firms, labor meaning only the employment that counts, and the externalization in terms of social groups, the leisure classes standing against the working class. In this context, or against this background, the matter of how labor changes, so the good or bad, doesn't consider sufficiently this exclusive character of employment, of labor, the negative classification that goes hand in hand. And it is as well about the matter of re-establishing the welfare state without looking at the decisive issue. Is it about the distribution of rights of individuals or the expression of socialized production? It is actually a matter I frequently discussed with Hans Zacher of the then Max Planck Institute for Foreign international social law under the heading of social rights today are very much about excess and control rights of individuals in this realm of the state. Next point then. Over accumulation, devaluation, productivity. For the time being, it doesn't really matter if it is an actual shift or if it's imagined or if it's a potential development. But even taking and accepting different terms, we have to see this in this wider context. Jason Moore talks about four sheets of labor, power, food, energy, and raw materials. Later with Patel, Nowadays, with Patel, he speaks of the seven sheeps nature, money, work, care, food, energy, and lives. If it's four, if it's seven, perhaps it's ten. The core issue is a downward shift of cost, an externalization of cost, not to make things cheaper, but to increase profits. Two different things. This profitability is about tributary systems, Samia Amin talking about this, or salvage accumulation, Anna Singh uh, speaks about. I myself occasionally referred to differentiating between formations, tributary societies, the non-state societies, slave societies, the polis societies, feudal societies as emerging state systems, developing capitalist societies, emerging state systems, capitalist societies, nation state societies, and the state monopolist societies, international state societies, globalized capitalist societies, globalized function regulative systems. Many different things come into play. Many people worked, and what I did is just kind of carrying together, putting together different things we did in Moscow, um, we did in, 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 um, with Korotyev and, and Brinin, uh, that, that had been done in, in Marxism uh, over the years, that had been done in, in the French uh, uh, discussions on, on state monopolism. And of course all this has to be differentiated. Further analysis has to be done. Uh, for instance, this, this interesting thing which Saskia uh, Sassen does with the process of demonetarization and decapitalization of finance. Finance, money, completely different things. Finance, capital, different things. Interesting when it comes then to this point of um, the, the different 
the, the difference in the lifestyles. We, as majority of the people, we in our daily life still pay with money. The economic process is at least seemingly independent of this. So far, we find some patterns today that Goethe mentioned in the words of Mephistopheles. No goal or measures set for you. Do as you wish, nibble at everything, catch at fragments while you're flying. Enjoy it all, whatever you find to do. Now grab at it and don't be stupid. Short-termism, we may add this to methodological uh, individualism, nationalism and, and uh, solutionism. This is another dimension of it. And what we easily overlook is that all this is not about greed of any subjective wrong. It is about the search for ways of socialization. The old issue. Socialization. The greatest good for the greatest number. You can take the utilitarian approach to it. You can take it as a matter of public. Then we have the same discussion or linked discussion, the volonté générale et le volonté de tout. All this is about publicness as a control of production, the control of the means of production. And even more so, you will forget talking about it, the publicness of control of societal value. We are great in social science to split up discussions. Talking about this control seems to be a matter of property rights, of legal issues, of economic issues. And then we have another discussion, justice and public reason, John Rawls and the libertarians uh, talking about this. And the sense of appropriateness, for instance, as Klaus Günther has in mind. Crucially important issues. But crucially important is to keep in mind that these are not philosophical, ethical, moral questions. These are the immediate economic questions we have to face and we have to address and solve today. Artificial intelligence, digitization, the estrangement, the alienation of human beings from themselves. These are not the questions. This is what we see at the level of uh, appearance. The matter is who are we and in which way do we define our public existence as social beings. I hope this gives a little bit an overview, as I said, a method, meta methodological perspective. Within this framework we then have to address detailed questions as well about labor, about welfare states and all this. But it is only valuable within this framework that we will manage to move further than trying to find another solutionist answer to supposedly solutionist questions. Thank you very much.